Welcome to the NTEB Prophecy News Podcast with your host and Bible teacher, Jeffrey Greider. Rightly divided, dispensationally correct, and standing on the authority of the King James Holy Bible. This program is brought to you by NowTheEndBegins.com. And good afternoon, happy Monday everybody, and welcome to this edition of the Prophecy News Podcast today. As Israel launches the siege of Gaza, the winds of war begin to blow across the entire world. Right now, multiple events are triggering across the Middle East that will have profound implications around the world and especially here at home for us in America. Israel has announced a complete siege of Gaza and has launched the invasion that includes a massive amount of ground troops, over 300,000 Israeli soldiers. In New York City yesterday, thousands of pro-Hamas demonstrators marched in support of the Palestinians and called for jihad to take place throughout the all five boroughs of New York City. Amos 1.7 says, But I will send a fire on the wall of Gaza, which shall devour the palaces thereof. On this episode, if the events of this past weekend were not enough to trigger your end times meter, what's coming this week most certainly will. By now, you know that the attack on Israel by Hamas was orchestrated and financed and carried out by the terror state of Iran. So if Israel is going to exact vengeance on Hamas in Gaza, if Israel is going to uh, exact vengeance on the people who have brutally slaughtered over 1,000 Israelis, including nine American citizens, it would stand to reason that they must needs do the same with Iran. We posted on our X channel yesterday how pro-Hamas rallies were held in dozens of cities around the world yesterday, a chilling harbinger of what's to come. Today on this episode, we're going to show you just how close to World War III we actually are and why what's happening in the Middle East right now could just possibly set the entire world on fire. Heavenly Father, we come before you, we commit this time to you, we ask you to work and move within our midst. We pray for the people in Jerusalem and in Israel. We pray for the souls in Gaza and Palestine. Lord, that whole region has been literally set on fire. And we just pray, Lord, uh, that your word will go forth. Um, your word is like a hammer that breaketh the rocks in pieces. And we just pray in the midst of this, Lord, you will raise up a thousand Christian missionaries to bring the gospel into the Middle East right now. Lord, we pray for lost souls. Karen is praying for Jason and Tiffany and grandchildren Summer, Austin and Emmett. Barbara is praying for son Jody. Mark Sherlock for Savannah and her mom Stephanie. Werner Bukes is praying for Bob and Abby. Nancy is praying for Brandon and Michelle. Jill is praying for Junie and Grant and their dad. Kathy Hughes, her son, needs to get saved. Haley C. is praying for Zane. Lulu is praying for unsaved family members and Miles and his family need to get saved. Ladies who are expecting, Megan Burton, Linda and Joe Lapiana's son and daughter-in-law, Terry Bryant's daughter, Jillian, Shira Shine's daughter-in-law, Cindy and Steve Britt's granddaughter, Taylor, Sandra C.'s daughter, Christina, in the Clark family, Stephanie and Christina, Christy Ireland and Char's daughter, Miranda. Uh, we are doing a shortened version of the prayer list today. There is just too much to talk about. Uh, we did the entire list for the Sunday service yesterday. We did most of the list last night. Um, so please make sure that you get the full list from Jeanette and you lift up all these prayer requests. But today our focus is going to be on the nation of Israel. It's going to be on the Jewish people. And we're also praying for the Palestinians. We're praying for, the, um, for everybody who is caught in this crossfire. And it is a sobering 
and unbelievable scene that we are watching. But let me tell you something. This is what we have been talking about. You know what today is? It is day three of the war in Gaza. There has not been a war with Israel and anybody for 50 years, for half a century. So today is day three of the war in Gaza, and today is day 1,302 of 15 days to flatten the curve. We told you three and a half years ago that you better buckle up and get prepared and stay buckled up because even though the lockdowns came to an end and everything else seemed to stop, those things were not everything. Those things were just some of the symptoms. But the main thing that we've been drawing your attention to for the past 1,302 days is you are watching the literal and visible fulfillment of Bible prophecy. I was talking with a friend of mine this morning, and they said, uh, uh, these things are literally leaping off the pages of our Bible. And make no mistake about it, what you're watching, what you've been watching for the past three days, since 6.17 a.m. Israeli time, Saturday morning, you are watching prophecy come to pass. You are watching all the things that we've been warning about for 14 years. Now is the moment, and this is the time. Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 1. The burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. O Lord, how long shall I cry and thou wilt not hear? Even cry out unto thee of violence and thou wilt not save? Why dost thou show me iniquity and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me and they that raise up strife and contention. Therefore the law is slacked, and judgment doth never go forth. For the wicked doth compass about the righteous, therefore wrong judgment proceedeth. Behold ye among the heathen, and regard, wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days. October 9th, 2003. I will work a work in your days which ye will not believe. Though it be told you, we've been warning about this and warning about this, and now the day has arrived. It's here. And what you're seeing is ten times more likely to trigger World War III than anything happening in Ukraine right now. What's happening in the Middle East right now is 10 times more likely to trigger World War III. Now, you want to know what the wars are? I'll tell you. The next war coming up is going to be World War III. Then you're going to have the Battle of Armageddon. And then you're going to have the Battle of Gog and Magog. That's what's going to happen. But between World War III and the Battle of Armageddon, And before the start of the time of Jacob's trouble, the church is going to be removed in the pre-tribulation rapture. There is no doubt about that. I've been standing on that for almost 30 years. And I believe the Bible verses for the pre-trib rapture more today than I did 30 years ago. But let me tell you something, Christian, if you're not ready, if you're not buckled up, if you're not prayed up, the events that are going to be taking place are going to horrify you. They are going to fill you with an unbelievable level of fear. So Heavenly Father, so Heavenly Father, we ask you to work and move as only you can. And all these prayers, Lord, we pray. Everybody who needs a healing, everybody who needs comfort, everybody who needs restoration and reconciliation, everybody on the entire prayer list, Lord, we lift up to you today. 
We don't have time to do the whole list, but we do have time to pray. And Father God, we pray for the Jews today. If nobody is going to stand for the Jewish people, we will. I will. They are your chosen people, and we are happy to stand shoulder to shoulder with the Jewish people. Happy to stand shoulder to shoulder. We stand for the nation of Israel. We stand with the nation of Israel. Shoulder to shoulder. Heavenly Father, we ask you to work and move as only you can. We pray for the Jews. We pray for... We pray for the Palestinians. We pray for the lost souls that exist in the Middle East. And we ask you to give us a witness and a door, an open door for the gospel with them. And you'll have to excuse me if it's, if I sound a little bit distracted, the messages are firing like you can't believe thousands and thousands of people are tuning in right now. And uh, it is crazy. It is crazy right now. But Lord, we commit this time to you and we say the war is real, the battle is hot, and the time is short. And we ask you, Father God, to equip us for the fight. And we ask these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, pray for me today that the podcast that we are having right now is exactly what the Lord would have me to say. Um, Lots of people sending me messages right now. A lot of people waking up right now. On Twitter, on X, there are hundreds of thousands of people right now watching the videos that we've been posting and reading the articles that we've been publishing. The world is on fire, and make no mistake about that. The world is on fire. I want you to think about this. On Saturday morning at 6.17 a.m. Israeli time, Israel time, Jerusalem time, Hamas launched an attack on the Jewish and Israeli people, they went house to house in the towns by Gaza and they broke into the homes and they dragged out into the streets by their hair grandmothers and grandchildren. They raped the young women. They lined them up against the wall and they shot them with machine guns. You know when the last time we saw Jews being lined up against the wall and gunned down with machine gun fire? You know when the last time that we saw that? World War II with the Nazis. And they didn't just get two or three people or 20 or 30 or two or 300. There are thousands of dead Jews, Israelis, including nine Americans that we know of so far. They gunned them down by the dozens. Zechariah 14, talking about the day of the Lord. This is not our time right now. We are not going to be here for these verses that I'm about to read to you. But I want to read a verse to you from Zechariah chapter 14. And I want you to think about what this verse is saying for the time of Jacob's trouble. And what we saw this weekend and what we're seeing right now. Zechariah 14 verse 1. Behold... The day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. 
and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished. I want you to think about I'm going to say that again. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished. And half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. That's not our time. That's the time of Jacob's trouble. But we got a taste of that on Saturday and Sunday. Hamas terrorists went from house to house. They rifled the houses. They ravished the women. And then they murdered them by the thousands. If you're waiting for the end times to take place, you are way behind the curve. Now, let me tell you something that to me is astonishing. Let me tell you something to me that I cannot even wrap my mind around it. What was done to the Jewish people, and from this point on, when I talk about the Jews, I mean all the Israelis, everybody living in Israel. That's that's who I'm talking about. What was done to the Jews on Saturday defies logic. If you don't know the Bible, it defies explanation. It is a throwback to the days of Nazi Germany with the Holocaust. Now you would think that with atrocities like that, that at the very least for a week or two, you would have a global outpouring of support for the nation of Israel. And I want you to listen to me now. Don't miss what I'm about to tell you. Israel was attacked the likes of which they have not seen since World War II, since Nazi Germany. And there is no global outpouring of support for the Jewish people. There's pockets of support, but there is no unified outpouring of support for the Jewish people. You want to know what happened yesterday in America? You want to know why America is never going to be great again? No matter who you vote for? You want to know why America is in the garbage can? Yesterday in Times Square in New York City, the financial center of the entire world, the Democrats held a rally in support of Palestine, in support of the Hamas terrorists that did what they did to the Jewish people this past weekend. The name of the rally was called All Out for Palestine. And you know who sponsored it? A group called the Democratic Socialists of America. You know who the leader of the Democratic Socialists of America are? Bernie Sanders, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Ilhan Omar, and all the rest of that crew of people. That's who held that rally yesterday. Not one word of kindness or sympathy for the Jewish people. Not one word about the hundreds and hundreds of people who were gunned down with Hamas machine gun fire. Not one word of sympathy. You want to know what their lead speaker had to say? Because I got the clip. And before I play this clip, let me tell you something. If you live in New York, Chicago, Philadelphia, Portland, Los Angeles, Jacksonville, Florida, 
If you live in any major American city, you better prepare for war. Yesterday, they chanted death to America in Times Square in a rally sponsored by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and her people. And you want to know what their lead speaker said? Take a listen to this. This is from yesterday. Democratic Socialists of America, Times Square, New York City. We're done being tortured and hurt and judged. This is the correct religion. This is the religion that all of humanity needs to be a part of Islam. And we will not stop until it enters every home. So I want you to repeat after me. I want to hear it in every single district. It should tremble. Brooklyn should hear it. The Bronx should hear it. Queens should hear it. Say it as if the Ummah depends on this, my brothers and sisters. La ilaha illallah. God worthy of worship except Allah, the God of Jesus, the God of Moses, the God of Abraham, and the God of the last and final prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That was yesterday from the All Out for Palestine rally sponsored by the Democratic Socialists of America. Now you know why they have allowed millions of illegals to pour over our southern border. They have been creating terror cells. They're called sleeper cells. Have you ever wondered why when you look at all the videos of these, these migrants that are coming across the border? Have you ever wondered why it's almost no women, it's almost no children, but it's all men in their 20s and early 30s? Have you ever wondered about that? They're creating an army. They're getting ready to launch in American cities. Am I saying that it looks like we are going to see a return of terrorist attacks on American soil? You better believe that we're going to see that. What do you think is going to happen when Netanyahu flattens Gaza? Um, Denise is asking, is AOC a natural born American or is she part Palestinian? I don't know. Let's find out. Is AOC Palestinian? Let's find out. Um, well, Google is not providing an immediate um, answer, but I do know this. I do know that she is very much in support of the two-state solution. I know that she is very much against the nation of Israel. Um, I know that she does not like the Jewish people. I know that for a fact. I'm looking for a clip right now that I'll see if I can pull that up in a little bit. I don't know what her nationality is. Um, but she is very, very much anti-Israel. <sighs> All right, let me play this clip. There's a town called Lukeville, Arizona. And it's a, it's a place in the massive state of Arizona that almost nobody pays attention to. And yet it is a hot spot for tens of thousands of illegal migrants. Take a listen to this report filmed on the ground right, in Lukeville. Back in Lukeville, Arizona, uh, we broke this story a couple months ago where this had become the new crossing point for illegals. We've had uh, reporters down here for the last couple months. It's been continuous. Just came back down. You've got uh, mostly West African, you have people from India, people from Egypt. But for whatever reason, the cartels have moved a huge number of people to this area, out in the middle of nowhere, Arizona, all coming through here. Closed area. Okay. So I'm going to ask you to stay just on that side of it. You're welcome to, to film all you want. Sure. Just this side of the street, it is close to the public. What about here or on this side? Nope. 
just on that side. Okay, so only illegals here. Uh, Border Patrol, you could tell, they're so frustrated. They want this to be reported. So I went up and I was able to get some really close up footage of these guys. Uh, unfortunately, we had somebody from the national parks come out and tell me that this was a closed off location. Uh, press is not allowed to be as close as I was. So I had to move over here across the road. So apparently only illegals can be on that part of our national park. Almost all fighting age men, they said over 500 today that came through, big day, and they said the new location where people are coming from, and this is shocking to me because I haven't heard this, is Syria. Uh, big numbers coming to Lukeville, Arizona from Syria. Coming to Lukeville, Arizona from Syria. Did you hear what that man said? And he's on the ground in Lukeville, Arizona. 500 fighting age men coming in every single day, and the majority of these people are migrating from Syria. At least 150 fighting age men here right now. They said they took the women and children earlier. They prioritized them. But uh, it's... It's bad, guys. It's really bad. I mean, there's no other way to put it. It's just really, really bad. Biden did it. Mayorkas did this. They're not doing anything to stop it. New round of Biden's recruits. Coming in. Yeah, make sure you get your waters, guys. Don't want you to get thirsty. Yeah, make sure we keep those bags. Concierge service. down. Here comes your new neighbors, America. Hundreds of fighting age men coming into Lukeville, Arizona every single day. Who let them in? Why are they coming in? They are here. Over the weekend, one of the main phrases that was trending on X was death to America. Now, I want you to ask yourself this question. Israel was attacked in a way that we have not seen, that I have not seen in my lifetime. They were gunned down in the streets with machine guns. And there is no outpouring of support for the Jews and for Israel. There's pockets of support, but there is no coalition of support for the nation of Israel. At the United Nations, they are already telling Netanyahu to back down. Now, let me tell you something. Netanyahu, I don't know who was asleep at the switch. And um, we're probably going to do a podcast on this. Who turned the cameras off? Why was nobody watching? How were all these militants, these terrorists, how were they allowed just to easily cross the border? That's a question that we're asking, but that's a question that the entire nation of Israel is going to be asking in the coming days. And indeed, they're asking it right now. Who stopped monitoring the border? Somebody allowed this to take place. Somebody allowed this to happen. Now, if you believe Scripture, it is a very easy and logical case to make that the Lord is the one who put a veil over the eyes of the watchers in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. I don't know who stopped looking. I don't know who turned the cameras off, but somebody did. And we're going to be talking about that on a soon future podcast. But Benjamin Netanyahu, he is in a horrible, horrible, horrible position right now. If he doesn't 
get rid of Hamas once and for all. He's finished. I mean, I don't know what they would do to him if he doesn't handle this situation right now. But if he handles the situation right now, the entire world is going to come against him. Syria, Lebanon, Egypt, Iran. They're all going to come against him. Do you remember when we told you what the very first article that we did on January 1st of 2020? It was an article about war games between Russia, China, and Iran. That was the very first article that we did January 1st of 2020. And that set the tone for everything that followed. Don't you think that Russia is going to have something to say about this? Don't you think that China, Iran, don't you think that they're going to have something to say about this? Everybody knows now that it was the nation of Iran that financed this attack on Israel. So if Benjamin Netanyahu is going to take care of Hamas, if he's going to take care of Gaza, Jeanette wants to know why didn't the Iron Dome work? Why didn't the whole system work? Remember when Jeffrey Epstein committed suicide in his jail cell, but the two guards that were paid to watch him were suddenly not there. The video camera that was there to monitor what he did in his cell was inexplicably turned off with no good explanation. Well, multiply that by 100,000, and that's what happened on Saturday. All the cameras were turned off. All the drones were not up in the air. Nobody was monitoring at the IDF. It's as if everything was attached to a single switch and somebody turned it off. Over in America, Nikki Haley, she had a very strongly worded response. Now, I don't know if she has any chance to become our next president. I don't even know at this point if whoever becomes the next president is going to make one bit of difference. But I know that she's just about the only one who said something like this. Prime Minister Netanyahu, finish them. Finish them. Hamas did this. You know Iran's behind it. Finish them. They should have hell to pay for what they've just done. We don't know when our next 9-11 is going to happen. If ever there was a time that America needs to understand the difference between good and evil and right and wrong, it's now. Are you confident that President Biden has said enough, has, has said it strenuously and directly enough that we are in their corner? Well, Brian, I think the first thing is, you know, prayers for strength, prayers for determination for the people of Israel. But let's step back because I want the American people to kind of take this in for a second. Just imagine that here the Israelis woke up and communities were bombarded. Families were murdered. Women and children were taken hostage, dragged through the streets. The elderly were taken. All of this has happened in front of everyone on top of thousands of rockets that hit Israel. This should be personal for every woman and man in America. Why? Because when they did this, when they did this surprise attack, when they took these hostages, when they murdered these families, they were celebrating. And what were they celebrating? They were saying death to Israel, death to America. This is not just an attack on Israel. This is an attack on America because they hate us just as much. And what we have to understand is this is the reason that we have to unite around making sure our enemies do not hurt our friends. 
America can never be so arrogant to think we don't need friends, just like we needed them on 9-11. That's why Ukraine needs us when Russia's doing this. That's why Israel needs us when Hamas and Iran are doing this. And I'll say this to, to Prime Minister Netanyahu, finish them finish them. Hamas did this. You know Iran's behind it. Finish them. They should have hell to pay for what they've just done. Senator Lindsey Graham has said that make it clear to Iran that if uh, if they get involved, if Hezbollah gets involved, we start blowing up their refineries. Would you would you have, what kind of message would you send to Iran? Would you to let them know that they will be hit directly if something else happens that we know they're responsible? Well, the first thing I would say is look at what is being said by Russia and China. Absolutely nothing. There's a U.N. Security Council meeting tomorrow. Guess what they're going to say? I can tell you right now. They're going to say to de-escalate. They're going to say to cease fire. They're going to tell Israel, don't fight back. They're not going to say they're going to condemn Hamas, but they're not going to call out Iran. Why? Because Russia, China and Iran are joined at the hip. All China and Iran are joined at the hip. I'm going to stop her right there. <clears throat> you just heard her say that Russia, China, and Iran, Iran, whatever, they are joined at the hip. And that was the very first article that we did on January 1st of 2020. Israel does not have the global support to do what they must do, to do what they have to do. Can you imagine? I want you to think about this now. Can you imagine if after Pearl Harbor on December 7th of 1941 and with the newsreel footage of all those dead Americans just floating in the water, can you imagine what America would have said to any other country, to any other nation who would have dared to open their mouth and say, you better step down, you better de-escalate, you better try to make peace. Can you imagine how mad that would or should make you if you're an American? The idea that you should step down and de-escalate Israel doesn't need to step down and de-escalate. Netanyahu needs to do what he has said that he was going to do over the last 15 years. He needs to end Hamas. They are a terrorist organization. And that's what I was telling you earlier. He is in a very bad spot. If he doesn't end Hamas... He's finished. Israel is finished. But if he does end Hamas, what happens after that? Iran does what? Lebanon? Egypt? Jordan? Iraq? Russia, China. So if we know that, what we have to do is start being strong. You're not strong by giving them six billion dollars like Biden did. And he can say it's not in their banks, but they're moving money around because they know it's coming. You're not being strong by lifting sanctions like Biden did. They're getting tons of oil money and all that oil money goes to Hamas, Hezbollah, the Houthis, all of those terrorist activities. They're, they, they see the weakness that we've shown from Afghanistan and everything else. What we have to do is start showing strength. First, we have to make sure Israel secures its borders. The second thing is we need to call on all the Arab countries and ask them where they stand on this. And they can't just stand and say ceasefire. They've got to stand against evil. And that's why this matters, Brian, is we have to have moral clarity. If ever there was a time that America needs to understand the difference between good and evil and right and wrong, it's now. America has been way too divided. Now's the time to come together and say we need to unite for our brothers and sisters in Israel, we need to unite for freedom. We need to unite for democracy all around the world. And we need to unite America because we can never think that this won't happen. America because we can never think that this won't happen. All right. So obviously America is not united. America as a nation is struggling to to 
decide what side that we stand on. How about you? What side do you stand on? I stand with the Jews. I stand with the nation of Israel. I stand with the capital of Israel, the city of Jerusalem. Where do you stand and what side do you stand on? In Times Square yesterday, and forgive me for playing it again, but in Times Square yesterday, this is what the Democrats were applauding and encouraging. Thousands and thousands of liberals and Democrats flooding Times Square We're done being and listening tortured to this. And hurt and judged. This is the correct religion. This is the religion that all of humanity needs to be a part of Islam. And we will not stop until it enters every home. So I want you to repeat after me. I want to hear it in every single district. It should tremble. Brooklyn should hear it. The Bronx should hear it. Queens should hear it. Say it as if the Ummah depends on this, my brothers and sisters. La ilaha illallah. God worthy of worship except Allah, the God of Jesus, the God of Moses, the God of Abraham, and the God of the last and final prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's what happened in Times Square yesterday. The sleeper cells have been stocked. The last two and a half years of Barack Obama's third term has allowed three million illegal immigrants across our open southern border. And that we just might have to pay a price here in America for what's happening in the Middle East right now. So what is happening on day three of the Israel Hamas war. Building housing Let's Hamas a operatives, a command center used by a senior official in Hamas's naval forces, an operational asset used by Hamas located within a mosque, and an asset used by the terror group for intelligence. The retaliatory strikes come as over 700 Israelis have been confirmed murdered by the Hamas onslaught. The Israeli Health Ministry this morning, being Monday, saying around 2,400 are wounded, with over 300 of the injured in serious condition. Well, let's now go to northern Israel, where our correspondent Pierre Kloschendler is standing by. Pierre, the worries are that this could become a war on all borders with Hezbollah in the north there. What are you seeing on the ground there this morning? I don't know if you're able to hear what's happening uh, there's a loud noise of uncrewed aerial vehicles that are patrolling the skies between Israel and Lebanon at this moment. And it's been an incessant loud noise here where we are standing on the Israeli-Lebanese border in an undisclosed location for obvious security reasons. But let me show you a little bit the lay of the land here. There is a first wall which is more of a protective wall and then behind that wall there is another wall which is on the blue line which is the un recognized israel lebanese border in this section of uh, the border in uh, western galilee the situation looks quite on the way to the border we've seen a few crews of reserve soldiers camping on the side of the roads. We've seen them also patrolling along the roads. There's some roadblocks uh, along the roads leading to the border. But we haven't seen, at least it's not on in the public eye, we haven't seen the reinforcements that everybody's talking about. Although what we understand is that those reinforcements are not uh, in the same amount as the forces of the IDF streaming towards the Gaza Strip. Yet, uh, there is a, 
an obvious reason to reinforce the northern border uh, to contain any possible escalation into a multi-front theatrical operation. And the- so let me just pause that clip for a second. Um, I'm on the website timesofisrael.com. For the past two and a half hours, the Jerusalem Post website has been taken offline. I don't know if it's been hacked. I don't know if it was given a um, a dedicated denial of service virus. I don't know whether it just wasn't able to handle the millions of people who want information about what's happening in Jerusalem. But I do know that jpost.com has not been operational for the past three and a half hours. So let me go to the timesofisrael.com. Hezbollah threatens retaliation for deadly border flare-up. Gaza rockets bombard the south. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's defined goal for the war at this stage is to deprive Hamas of the ability and motivation to harm Israel. A senior Israeli government source tells reporters, this source notes that that is a very broad definition and our interpretation of it is not limited. Um, That just sounds like mumbo jumbo to me. Uh, But here's a headline, terror group member killed in Israeli shelling, several in Israel injured in firefight on Lebanon frontier. And residents in north ordered to shelter, and the fighting persists in the south. So if you look on a map, you have Israel, then you have the Golan Heights and Syria to the upper right-hand corner, and then you have Lebanon on top of that. And one of the reasons why Israel has so strongly maintained their right to control their part of the Golan Heights is for just an example like what we're looking at right now. Without that buffer zone, Hezbollah would be able to come right across the border and enter um, uh, the northern part of the nation of Israel with no problem at all. And um, Israel has maintained for many, many years now uh, that they are not going to give up the control over the Golan Heights. Uh, When Obama was president, he was constantly trying to get world support to go against Israel to put pressure on them to release their sovereignty over the Golan Heights. But it is that area that gives Israel a very important and very necessary... This is why, at this moment, uh, there are reinforcements and the IDF is in a heightened state of alert. Pierre Clash and Lau, correspondent there in northern Israel, no doubt will be coming to you later on in the day for more updates. With me here in studio, meantime, is retired Colonel Dr. Jacques Neria, the former Deputy Head of Assessment for Israeli Military Intelligence and the former Foreign Policy Advisor to Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, and Guy Azrael, I-24 News Senior Producer and Correspondent. Gentlemen, good morning and thank good you morning. for being here. Um, I'd like to start with this notification that we have just got. The Thai Foreign Ministry says that 12 nationals were killed, 8 wounded, and 11 kidnapped in southern Israel. How many more foreign nationals, apart from Israelis, are we likely to hear that have actually been captured into the Gaza Strip? And what then would be Hamas's aims with foreign nationals as opposed to perhaps Jews or Israelis? Well, the foreign nationals could be also Jews. But the, 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 the thing is that uh, what we know is that uh, several uh, uh, hostages who carry, I mean, like lots of Israelis carry double nationality. So we're talking about Americans, we're talking about uh, Mexicans, we're talking about Europeans. And I think that uh, this will, uh, in, in a way, uh, weigh very, very, very much uh, when the Egyptians, Egyptians will talk to Hamas about releasing at least the women and the kids. This is the, this is the first uh, priority right now. And I think that this is, they will concentrate on that. Uh, uh, meaning, I mean, but uh, Hamas has already said 
that it will uh, they will not uh, abide uh, unless there's something in return what do they mean i mean they they they, they say very clearly that the intention of of, uh, of uh, having 100 or 130 hostages in uh, in gaza is to release to empty the uh, israeli prisons we're talking about what we're talking about at least 5088 security prisoners palestinian ones that are the worst criminals on earth and that they uh, want to be released the, at this point i don't think that there is much to talk about uh, with the Hamas. I don't think that there is a, a dialogue that can be established on this basis. And Guy, I want to bring you in here on a personal note because yeah. steroid residents have been told, as we heard from our correspondent... Residents have been told, as we heard from our correspondent... All right, let me stop that clip right there. The State Department, the U.S. State Department, says that at least nine American citizens have been killed by Hamas in the attacks on Israel... This past weekend, the State Department says it's unclear how many other American citizens are missing or unaccounted for at this time. So, I want you, when you are trying to wrap your head around what's taking place right now, as you're trying to wrap your head around uh, what took place over the weekend and contemplate what could possibly be coming down the road in the coming days. How does it make you feel that Hamas has murdered a minimum of nine American citizens? Is this not an attack on America? Take a listen. Fox News Nine Americans killed a lot of in smoke. Hum- They'll calm down again, and then it kind of happens over and over again as the war is continuing there in Israel. Now, we did just get some information, some breaking news coming in from the U.S. Embassy, their spokesperson saying that they can confirm the deaths of nine U.S. citizens. They say they extend their deepest condolences to the victims and to the families of all those affected. We continue to monitor the situation closely and remain in touch with our Israeli partners and local authorities. We are in touch with the families and providing all appropriate assistance. We will continue to provide information to U.S. citizens in the area through alerts, our embassy website, and travel.state.gov. So again, the U.S. Embassy confirming nine U.S. citizens have died there as a result of that surprise attack by Hamas that has killed about 1,100, nearly 1,200 people. Nine of those confirmed to be Americans, and that number only expected to rise. It is now 919. To rise. It is now 919. And that number is only expected to rise. Um... I see multiple websites reporting that the official death toll in Israel has gone past 800 now. And I am telling you, it is going to easily go past 1,000, maybe even 2,000. And um, it is absolutely crazy what's going on. Now, turn to Matthew chapter 24. Turn to Matthew chapter 24. If you want to know where we are on the end times timeline right now, I'll be very happy to tell you. Matthew 24 verse 4. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, see that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Now, maybe in all of the excitement and the drama and the hysteria and the shock and the the atrocities that we've all been watching for the past three days. Maybe you didn't pay attention to the fact that in the Middle East, multiple major six point and above earthquakes were triggering at the same time Hamas was attacking Israel. Take a listen to this 
Where is it? Here it is. Take a listen to this. Earthquakes and the attack on Israel Now, the death toll from a deadly earthquake of magnitude 6.3 that jolted western Afghanistan on Saturday. Close to 2,000 people have died following a powerful earthquake in Afghanistan yesterday. That's according to the Taliban, which released those numbers this morning. The 6.3 magnitude quake struck the heart of Herat City in the western Herat province, which is the third largest in Afghanistan. The quake was followed by multiple aftershocks. A magnitude 6.3 earthquake followed by strong aftershocks rocked the region. Six villages have been destroyed near the city of Herat. Rescue and recovery efforts are currently underway. Thousands of people displaced and forced to take shelter in the city's abandoned buildings. It is one of the deadliest earthquakes to hit the country in 20 years. Um, into those small, tiny communities around the border, peaceful kibbutzim, people on a Saturday morning, on a Jewish holiday, on the Jewish Sabbath. Anyhow, it's going to be a terrible um, uh, fight now. And what I'm worried about is that... Um, As the Israelis are stretched out in Gaza and as they're doing what they must do, particularly to retrieve those more than 100 hostages, infants, children, women, um, that at that point the Iranians will use their other proxy, Hezbollah, to attack from the north. And Hezbollah is even more well-armed than um, uh, Hamas. And they have 150,000 rockets, some of them very long range. So they'll they'll put everything... uh, uh, into that if they, they do attack. I think this is all a cover, um, Amanda, for th- something that's happening in two weeks' time. It's the anniversary of the uprising in Iran, and Iran doesn't want any international attention on that. And in those two weeks, uh, the International Atomic Energy Agency says that Iran will achieve enough fissile uranium to build its first atom bomb. God help us all if uh, the Ayatollah regime... Uh, gets uh, atomic weapons. The astonishing Hamas assault comes after decades of relentless and bitter conflict with Israel, the fighting costing thousands of lives and forcing generations to grow up under occupation. The militant group claims this assault is payback for Israeli atrocities against Palestinians, including what it calls the desecration of a holy mosque in East Jerusalem and a 16-year blockade of Gaza. Gaza, a tiny area only 40 kilometres long and 11 kilometres wide and one of the most contested pieces of land in history. Held by the Ottoman Empire until 1917 when it was put under British control, After the Second World War, thousands of Jews fled Europe in the wake of the Holocaust, and the United Nations split Palestinian territory into Arab and Jewish states in 1947. (laughs) Leader David Ben-Gurion founded the State of Israel in 1948, and from that moment, it was under assault from its Arab neighbours. Egypt attacked Israel through the Gaza Strip, and while Israel won the war, Gaza remained under the control of Egypt and Palestinian refugees poured in. Numerous insurgencies and the Six-Day War followed, Israel making territorial conquests, including Gaza and the Sinai Desert from Egypt, and the West Bank and East Jerusalem from Jordan. But in 1973, a huge blow to its security forces. It is an all-out war. The Yom Kippur War, an invasion by Egypt and Syria that Israel's military did not see coming. While ceasefires were agreed with Arab neighbours, tensions remained. The seeds of the current conflict were sown after Israel withdrew from Gaza in 2005 and militant group Hamas seized control. (laughs) Hamas, listed as a terrorist group by countries including Australia, started the campaign to destroy the Israeli state. Israel responded with invasion in 2008 in which an estimated 1,000 people were killed. It invaded again in 2014, which saw 2,200 killed in Gaza, along with 73 Israelis. A flashpoint throughout has been the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem, Islam's third holiest site, built on Judaism's holiest, the Temple Mount. Recent visits by hard-right members of Israel's government inflaming tensions. It's one of the reasons Hamas gave for yesterday's shocking assault which came almost 50 years to the day since the Yom Kippur War. War. Mm. 
So that's a headline update from our friend Jason A. over on YouTube. If you haven't checked out his channel, uh, go to YouTube and uh, look at all the great content from Jason A. And he performs a very valuable service by gathering all those headlines together and putting them in one cohesive uh, stream that we can play here. Um, That's really, really good stuff. Catherine B., She is struggling with her health right now. Catherine B., she's listening to the program. She says, I'm in dialysis and I'm not feeling great. My stomach is upset. My mesentery artery may be closing up again. I really need your prayers. She said, I love you all. Heavenly Father, we lift up our sister Catherine B., and we ask you to work and move in her life and uh, give her the healing that she needs, Lord. And uh, Lord, she has been such a a great blessing to this ministry, and uh, she's just true and faithful, and uh, we ask you to keep your healing hand upon her, Lord. Give her comfort and strength. Heather says, um, please pray for my daughter, Sophia, and please keep her on the prayer list for salvation. Time is short. Um, Lord, we do lift up Sophia, and we ask you, Lord, to uh, work and move in her life that she may consider salvation in Jesus Christ. Um, And we ask this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, Two prayer requests that are coming in while we're doing the program. Nothing more important than praying for each other. If you're just tuning in, we're looking at the Middle East. We're looking at what's happening now with the nation of Israel. We're looking at a, a unbelievable series of events that have taken place over the last three days. And now in the United States, we are sending military aid, battleships, and fighter jets over to the Middle East. Now, are we sending those things to defend Israel? Yeah, maybe. But I think that we're looking at a much larger conflict. Well, Israel's Take a listen first to ally, this. the U.S., says it's sending additional military aid and deploying an aircraft carrier group in a show of support for Israel. Let's go live to John Hendren in Washington, D.C. John, so the U.S. deploying this aircraft carrier strike group to the region, presumably all part of the unwavering support for Israel. That's right. That unwavering support, Darren, comes in very tangible form. For those who don't know, an aircraft carrier strike group has an aircraft carrier and several boats around it capable of firing missiles and and performing other uh, devastating functions. So there's that. You've also got uh, additional fighter jets that have been sent to the area. The Secretary of Defense in the U.S. says that uh, additional aid, including munitions, have been sent and will arrive in Israel over the coming days. That tells you they don't expect this conflict to be over any day soon. So the U.S. is is making this commitment of deterrence um, to deter anyone else in the region from taking advantage of this situation and threatening Israel. They are investigating the possibility that Iran might have been in, uh, involved. They, so far, Anthony Blinken says they don't have evidence of that. But if that were the case, that would be one of those parties that all of this is designed to deter. This is a massive terrorist attack that is gunning down Israeli civilians in their towns, in their homes, and as we've seen so graphically, literally dragging people across the the border with Gaza, including a Holocaust survivor in a wheelchair, women and children. So you can imagine the impact this is having throughout Israel, and the world should be revolted at what it's seen. Uh, We have immediately um, engaged uh, our Israeli partners and uh, and allies. President Biden was on the phone with Prime Minister Netanyahu early yesterday to assure him of our full support. Uh, I was on the phone with the Israeli president, the foreign minister. The entire government has been engaged throughout the region and well beyond. And John, so in terms of the diplomatic effort, I mean, Washington's been calling for restraint, but is it too early yet to talk about any possible U.S. role in mediation? Well, the U.S. had been attempting to mediate between uh, Israel and Saudi Arabia, trying to develop a new recognition uh, of, of mutual recognition pact where those countries would normalize 
their relations. And now they find they're scrambling in crisis mode, and they are doing diplomacy. Blinken has been talking to his counterparts in the region in the Middle East and in North Africa. And, and yes, indeed, part of that is an effort to try to de-escalate that conflict. Another part of it is to try to see what can be done to persuade Hamas to release some of those captives that, is, that it is holding. Some are thought to be an American. Four American citizens have died in that conflict, among the many others who have as well. That's not the only U.S. interest, but that gives the U.S. a direct stake there. And they want to be deeply involved in these negotiations. All right. Uh, John Hendren, live for us there in Washington, D.C. John, thank you. And so here you have the United States and what they're doing is um, we're sending uh, military transports and fighter jets and battleships and uh, we're doing all sorts of things. Why are we doing that? We're doing that because uh, it is it is relatively obvious at this point that a much wider, a much wider conflict is about to break out, and um, this this is this is what we've been talking about for a long, long time now, and uh, we have seen it get right to the edge multiple times over the years. Now the end begins has been reporting on this uh, for about fourteen years now, and um, uh, now it's here. Now it's arrived. And so I want you to understand the magnitude of what you're watching. You're not seeing just another military exercise. You're not seeing just another ongoing dispute between the Palestinians and the Jews. You are watching something on a level that um, we have never seen before in the nation of Israel. Yes, the Yom Kippur War uh, was pretty bad. That, that was in 1973. It lasted for about two weeks. Can you imagine what's happening right now, ending in two weeks? No, you can't. Because what's happening right now is on a level of things that did not happen in the Yom Kippur War. And I think that you would have to probably go back to the 1947 War of Independence to find something that reaches the level that we're at now, and we're not even anywhere close to how high it's going to go. And so we're going to continue to pray for Israel. We're going to continue to pray for the Jewish people. Um, highly likely that we'll be doing a special um, uh, podcast on Wednesday at noon. So make sure that you mark your calendars. Uh, highly likely that we will be doing a special broadcast on noon to keep everybody up to speed uh, with what's going on. Uh, let me play this clip for you. There is a man by the name of David Icke. And over the years, he has reposted many of the articles to his website that we have published on Now the End Begins. And I don't understand why. David Icke, as you're going to hear, is very much against the Jewish people. He is anti-Semitic. And I want you to listen to what David Icke says about the nation of Israel and about what's happening I've been now. exposing for decades now and being called anti-Semitic for it, even though it's the opposite. I've been exposing a cult. There's a, a global cult, and there, are, there is a major aspect of it, which is called the Sabbatean cult. The Sabbatean cult goes back to the 1600s. I've detailed it all in the books. But basically, it is a a grouping, a satanic grouping that is expert in posing as what it's not. So they might pose as Islamic leaders. They might pose as Vatican leaders. 
or they might and have mercilessly for the Jewish people in general, they might and have posed as Jewish leaders. It was this Sabbatean cult with the Rothschilds very much involved who were responsible for the creation of Israel in 1948 and the horrors, the horrors matching, matching what's happened now and more imposed by Sabbatean actually, but officially Jewish terrorist groups like Ergun and the Stern Gang, who forced hundreds of thousands of Palestinians to leave their homeland in terror, never to return. So when you look at what's happening now, and the horrors of what has been imposed upon Jewish civilians, we should not take sides. Because when you get to the core of what's controlling this side and what's controlling that side, ultimately, you're looking at the same people. And Sabbateans, who have been the controllers of Israel from the start, and then moved in on places like America, they, irony of ironies, hate Jewish people. They have contempt for them. And I've been saying all these years that in the end, this Sabbatean cult is going to throw the Jewish people in general under a colossal bus. And we are now, as I speak, seeing that happen. Seeing that. So that was David Icke, and the only reason why I played that clip is that he has been, his name has been trending on X over the weekend, and there are a lot of people who listen to him, and he is an anti-Semite, as you can obviously tell, and um, uh, he is not for the Jewish people, he is against the nation of Israel. And I just want you to know that he is not somebody that you should be getting your information from. Um, kind of like Alex Jones. He has some stuff that turns out to be true. And every once in a while, you know, he'll say something right. But Alex Jones is not a Christian. He's a deist. Alex Jones is not a born-again Christian. Alex Jones is not overly in favor of the nation of Israel and the Jewish people. So you've got to be very careful who you listen to. And I just wanted to give you the heads up about David Icke. Um, and again, I don't know why he's posted so many articles from Now the End Begins. Uh, we are obviously pro-Israel and pro-Jew. Um, but he has... And, uh, you know, Paul says that he rejoices in every way that the gospel is preached through contention or strife or people doing it for real. And, um, you know, we, we are happy when people repost our stuff and uh, we're, we are very happy to see the word get out. Uh, I haven't had time to listen to this clip. And if it's boring or stupid, I'll just turn it off. But uh, this is a briefing by the United Nations on the Middle East crisis um, recently published to X just moments ago. And I'm going to listen to it for the first time with you on what's happening in the Middle East from the perspective of the United Nations. Good morning. I've just concluded an extraordinary meeting of senior UN leaders to discuss the unprecedented developments in Israel and the occupied Palestinian territory. Let me begin by repeating my utter condemnation of the abhorrent attacks by Hamas and others against Israeli towns and villages in the Gaza periphery, which have left over 800 Israelis dead and more than 2,500 injured. Sadly, these numbers are expected to rise as the attacks are ongoing and many remain unaccounted for. 
In addition, over 100, possibly more, Israelis, civilians and military, have been reported captured by armed groups, including women, children and the elderly. Some are being held hostage inside Israel, and many others have been taken inside the Gaza Strip. Meanwhile, Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad have launched thousands of indiscriminate rockets that have reached central Israel, including Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. I recognize the legitimate grievances of the Palestinian people, but nothing can justify these acts of terror and the killing, maiming, and abduction of civilians. I reiterate my call to immediately cease these attacks and release all hostages. In the face of these unprecedented attacks, Israeli airstrikes have pounded Gaza. I'm deeply alarmed by reports of over 500 Palestinians, including women and children, killed in Gaza and over 3,000 injured. Unfortunately, these numbers are rising by the minute as Israeli operations continue. While I recognize Israel's legitimate security concerns, I also remind Israel that military operations must be conducted in strict accordance with international humanitarian law. Civilians must be respected and protected at all times. Civilian infrastructure must never be a target. And we already have reports of Israeli missiles striking health facilities inside Gaza, as well as multi-storied residential towers and a mosque. Two UNRWA schools sheltering displaced families in Gaza were also hit. Some 137,000 people are currently sheltering in UNRWA facilities, with the number increasing as heavy shelling and airstrikes continue. I am deeply distressed by today's announcement that Israel will initiate a complete siege of the Gaza Strip, nothing allowed in, no electricity, food or fuel. The humanitarian situation in Gaza was extremely dire before these hostilities. Now it will only deteriorate exponentially. Medical equipment, food, fuel and other humanitarian supplies are desperately needed, along with access for humanitarian personnel. Relief and entry of essential supplies into Gaza must be facilitated, and the UN will continue efforts to provide aid to respond to these needs. And I urge all sides and the relevant parties to allow United Nations access to deliver urgent humanitarian assistance to Palestinian civilians trapped and helpless in the Gaza Strip. And I appeal to the international community to mobilize immediate humanitarian support for this effort. The UN Special Coordinator and I are engaging with leaders in the region to express our concern, our outrage, and to advance efforts to avoid any spillover to the wider Middle East. Even in these worst of times, and perhaps especially in the most trying moments, it is vital to look to the long-term horizon and avoid irreversible action that would embolden extremists and doom any prospects for lasting peace. This most recent violence does not come in a vacuum. The reality is that it grows out of a long-standing conflict with a 56-year-long occupation and no political end in sight. It's time to end this vicious circle of bloodshed, hatred and polarization. Israel must see its legitimate needs for security materialized, and Palestinians must see a clear perspective for the establishment of their own state realized. Only a negotiated peace that fulfills the legitimate national aspirations of Palestinians and Israelis, together with their security alike, the long-held vision of a two-state solution in line with the United Nations resolutions, international law and previous agreements, can bring long-term stability to the people of this land and the wider Middle East region. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So, like I said, I was listening to that for the first time with you, and he's ending. He started with talking about the occupation of Palestine by Israel, and he ends with two-state solution. Well, on Saturday, a man by the name of Gilad Erdan, he is the Israeli representative to the United Nations, he says, no two-state solution. Take a listen to this clip from Saturday night 
from the Israeli representative to the United Nations speaking to the United Nations. this is precisely why this atrocity is Israel's 9-11. From now, nothing will be as it was. I promise you. Today, we are shattering the paradigm. We are changing the equation. For 17 years since Israel unilaterally withdrew from Gaza, and since Hamas came to power, the world has tried to reason with these terrorists, barbaric terrorists. The international community sought to rehabilitate Gaza, giving tens of billions of dollars in aid. Friends, these funds did not go to building schools or hospitals. It was exploited only for terror. Every inch of Gaza has become part of Hamas's war machine, a war machine. The era of reasoning with these savages is over, over. Now is the time to obliterate Hamas's terror infrastructure, to completely erase it so that such horrors are never committed again. Ambassador Netta Tofik with the BBC. This format, closed consultations, do you want to see an open meeting of the Security Council? And to those countries who have said this will continue as long as there isn't a peace, a two-state solution, what's your reaction to their statements? It's either being naive or uh, more than being naive, because if I just describe to you and show you some quotes from the Hamas uh, charter, And uh, nobody, I don't remember anyone talking about achieving a peace agreement with Al-Qaeda or or with uh, ISIS. Peace cannot be achieved with uh, an organization that its sole only goal is to destroy you and to... So I'm going to stop him right there to just touch on something that he said. Nobody would ever dare mention having a peace accord with ISIS. Nobody would ever dare accord having, uh, say, having a, a, a peace treaty with any terrorist group. And yet, Israel is being told that they have to make peace with Hamas. Did we make peace with um, ISIS? No, under Donald Trump, we blew them to pieces. And we didn't really care what the world had to say about it because they were bloodthirsty terrorists whose only purpose in life was to kill and maim and destroy and rape and kill and burn and stab other human beings. Hamas is a group that you cannot have a peace treaty with. You either take them out or they take you out. Each and every one of your citizens. So it's, it's, it's only about fighting terrorism and radicalism. So therefore, we thought uh, there's no room now to have uh, a real discussion of the Security Council. Again... We are at a war now in in Israel. Uh, We have hostages being kept in uh, Gaza. Uh, We have a constant threat. They are still indiscriminately firing rockets and missiles at our towns and cities. So we are fully, totally focused on achieving our goal to remove this threat from our citizens. So there you had Gilad Erdan, and he's the Israeli representative to the United Nations, and he's saying uh, there there is going to be no peace with Hamas. There cannot be any peace with Hamas, and I agree with that statement. The Taliban, ISIS, ISIL, Al-Qaeda, you don't make peace with those people. You either fight them or they fight you. You either get rid of them or they get rid of you. I think we all remember those videos when Barack Obama was president of these ISIS um, soldiers, terrorists, and they were 
lining up their victims, forcing them to wear orange robes, and then publicly beheading them. And if you remember, Barack Obama was saying that he was going to fight ISIS, but he never really did. He just, he would send the planes up and they would bomb uh, uh, empty buildings and all sorts of stuff like that. Uh, But it wasn't until Donald Trump became president that America actually started to fight against ISIS and to get rid of them. And uh, they were just about neutralized, neutralized, neutralized um, until Joe Biden became president. And now what do you see? We're done being you see tortured this? and hurt and judged. This is the correct religion. This is the religion that all of humanity needs to be a part of Islam. And we will not stop until it enters every home. So I want you to repeat after me. I want to hear it in every single district. It should tremble. Brooklyn should hear it. The Bronx should hear it. Queens should hear it. Say it as if the Ummah depends on this, my brothers and sisters. La ilaha illallah. God worthy of worship except Allah, the God of Jesus, the God of Moses, the God of Abraham, and the God of the last and final prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Well, I think it's a safe bet that we understand that Jesus um, has nothing to do with the moon God Allah. And uh, we've talked about that many, many, many times. Um, Here's, I don't have a clip for this, but here is a Hamas spokesperson by the name of Abu Obadiah. And Abu Obadiah said this today. We have decided to put an end to the Zionist oppression of our people. From now on, Every attack on our people will be met with the execution of one of the enemy hostages and will be broadcast and publicized. Now, I just told you three minutes ago about the public executions that the ISIS people did multiple, multiple times when Barack Obama was president. Multiple, multiple times when Barack Obama was president. The Hamas people, they're doing the same thing. The Hamas people, now they have about 150 hostages right now. And some of those hostages are American citizens. A lot of those hostages are grandparents, Jewish grandparents and grandchildren. And so, one of the official spokespeople from Hamas, Abu Obadiah, said, Every attack on our people will be met with the public execution of the enemy hostages. Can you imagine what that's going to be like if they actually do that? And we start seeing those images coming across social media. This thing has the opportunity to spiral out of control on a level that we we've we've never seen before. We've been doing now the end begins for the past 14 years and we've seen a lot of crazy stuff. We've seen 8 years of Obama, we've seen ISIS and Antifa and Occupy Wall Street. We've seen $2 billion worth of damage from uh, Black Lives Matter back in the summer of 2020. Uh, We have absolutely seen some crazy things over the past 14 years. But I'm telling you, we are going to see some things with this that you have never seen before. And it is going to cause a global response 
of some kind. Now, as we contemplate these things and as we think about these things, I want you to remember what we are here to do. We are here to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are to go out into the highways and hedges and to compel them to come in. We are getting so many requests from jails and prisons in America for free Bibles. And today we're sending out 300 Bibles to Pastor uh, Chaplin, um, Marty Watkins, at the Macon County Jail in Decatur, Illinois. And if you would like to help us to do that, please go to BiblesBehindBars.com and make a donation. We have many, many more requests for Bibles than just that one place, and I'm going to be talking about that during the week. But we very, very much need your support right now. Uh, If you think it's a good idea to send out Bibles to prisoners, to send out King James Bibles, New Testaments, and Scripture portions into the jails and detention centers around America that are requesting these books, please go to BiblesBehindBars.com right now and be as generous as you possibly can be. Also, if you remember on the podcast, the special podcast that we did on Saturday, and um, a lot of people were suggesting that we need to send Bibles to Israel. And um, I got a text message earlier today from somebody who thinks that they have a connection um, in Israel to get Bibles over there. Um, So... We are going to start uh, uh, raising money to do that. I want to send a thousand Bibles to the nation of Israel, and I want to support. Uh, Rob is asking who opens the mail at NTEB. I do. Um, I want to send at least a thousand Bibles to missionaries in Israel right now. Uh, maybe. We'll have to send them to Jordan or some neighboring place. Uh, But uh, that is the goal. And we are working on a connection right now that will allow us to get Bibles into the nation of Israel by people who will make sure that they don't just sit in a warehouse, that these Bibles get into the hands of people. There's a very large messianic christian community in israel well over a hundred thousand people and uh, we want to support them if we can denise is saying can we pray for the souls of the palestinians and the jews absolutely heavenly father we pray as as we close this program we pray as the same way as we started this program we pray for the lost jewish people We pray for the lost Palestinian people. And we pray, Lord, that you would raise up Christians to bring these people the gospel. Kimmy says there's no flights to Israel. That's fine. We would send them by boat anyway. Lord, we pray for lost souls in the Middle East and that you would give us a witness and that you would um, allow your representatives to get in there with the gospel and with Bibles to any unsaved person. We pray for the hostages that they would be released safely. And uh, Lord, your holy city is a big fat mess right now. And we're watching a type of the armies of Antichrist. And I'm glad that we're not going to be here when the real thing is happening, but what's happening now is horrific and terrible. And we just pray, Lord, as your word says in Psalm 122.6, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. We love you, God. We love your city. We love your people. We pray for the Jews, for the Palestinians. And we pray, Lord, that many souls would get saved even in the midst of this conflict. 
And we ask all these things, Lord, and give you all the honor and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, So please go to BiblesBehindBars.com, make a donation. We're sending out those Bibles for the Macon County Jail today. And uh, we have many, many more requests that we need to fill. Uh, BiblesBehindBars.com. Well, that's it for today. But I think we're going to do a podcast on Wednesday at noon. So mark your your calendar that you'll be here noon Eastern time uh, for another Prophecy News podcast, Lord willing. Um, and with that, have a great week, everybody. But again, if you live in the cities, you better keep your eyes open. You better keep your eyes open. All right. Have a great weekend. Lately I've been looking back Along this winding road To the old familiar markers Of the mercies I have known I know it may sound simple But it's more than a cliche There's no better way to tell you Than to say God's been good In my life I feel blessed beyond my wildest dreams When I go to sleep each night And though I've had my share of hard times I wouldn't change them if I could Cause through it all God's been Times replay and I can see That I've cried some bitter tears But I felt his arms around me As I faced my greatest fears You see I've had more gains than losses And I've known more joy than hurt As his grace rolled down upon me Undeserved For God's been good In my life I feel blessed beyond my wildest dreams When I go to sleep each night And though I've had my share of hard times I wouldn't change them if I could Cause through it all, God's been good. For God has been my Father, my Savior, and my friend. His love was my beginning, and His love will be my end. I could spend forever trying. To tell you everything he is But the best way that I can say it Is this God's been good In my life I feel so blessed beyond my wildest dreams When I go to sleep each night And though I've had my share of hard times I wouldn't change them if I could Cause through it all God's been